was actually inspired from a friend's talk. Um, he does a little workshop around this thing called active patterns. It's, uh, it's really great, so I definitely have to thank uh, Paul Michael for about half of this slide deck. He, uh, he has this material, and I think it shows things pretty well. So you'll notice when his slides are there, because they'll look a little bit different than mine. But um, yeah, definitely thanks for him, and thanks for MoonComp for letting me do this. It's, it's actually really fun to have an opportunity, being nervous or not. So <laughs> we'll jump into this. OK, so like I mentioned, um, I'm borrowing some slides at some point from Paul Michael's talk. But uh, there's a bit of code that goes with it. And if you want to look at these slides for yourself, uh, you should check out this GitHub link. Um, it's really great. Uh, might be easier to see certain bits of code if you have a hard time reading code on slides. Hopefully, most of it will be readable. But um, if you want, uh, you can go there and, and grab a slightly easier to view copy uh, locally. Uh, real quick. Um, I'm lucky to uh, be here because of JET, and uh, they're, they're a great, uh, great place to work. I, I want to encourage people to check it out. We've got this careers link, but you can also come talk to me. We, uh, we are looking for a lot of people, all sorts of roles, both junior and senior. So no one should feel like they aren't included in this. Um, we also do training, so you don't even have to really know functional programming or even F sharp. So you know, this is, this is something that uh, should include everyone here. So if you're looking for something, uh, give it a shot and uh, check out that page or come talk to me. So before I jump into the main part of this talk, which assumes you are at least partly familiar with F Sharp, I want to give a quick crash course. Um, we've got a bit of an overview we need to do on F Sharp itself, like what is F Sharp, um, and some specific parts. I'm not going to really give a detailed overview of the whole language. There's quite a bit. Uh, so this will just kind of give you a taste to, to follow the slides. But if we have time for questions or uh, after, maybe tomorrow, we can, we can definitely dive deeper if people are interested. Um, so quick. Quick overview of where F Sharp came from. Uh, so Microsoft Research was, uh, you know, working on uh, the .NET runtime, and they were designing certain extensions and thinking about how to support more than just a few languages that they had started with, things like C Sharp and VB.NET. And one of these researchers, Don Syme decided that he wanted an ML. And so he chose OCaml as sort of a starting point to build this new language. And um, it's, it's interesting to think that it started as a .NET language. And it still very much runs in that environment. But it now supports more than just Windows. It runs on almost any operating system and uh, even compiles to JavaScript. There are multiple great compilers for this to JavaScript. You can, you can get it interfaced with GPUs. You can do all sorts of things with it. So I want to make sure people understand that this is not a language that's locked down to one OS or one vendor. Um, so it's, it's actually really great um, that you can pretty much use it anywhere. It's a functional first language. And that's kind of a weird, weird label to give something, because what does functional first mean versus just a functional programming language? It means it supports a lot of other ways to work. Multi-paradigm might be a, a word you throw out there. But what it really means is it builds sort of this habit in the user. Certain things are a lot easier and a lot more elegant. And so it encourages just through the use of the language and the features and how they write out uh, to use the functional side. It does allow you to go into you know, mutation, object orientation, and uh, a lot of custom uh, programming features like quotations. But all of those seem to be a little clunky, so you, you have to be very careful where you use them, um, because your code might start looking a little weird. And this, this is not by mistake. This is designed to help guide people to using F Sharp idiomatically. Uh, you've probably seen this pipeline operator. Um, F Sharp is actually where this comes from. It's simply a function application. It's the reverse of the dot operator in Haskell and some other languages. It's awesome. Um, there are slight, uh, a slight family of other variants. Um, 
You can see the arrow going the other direction sometimes in F-sharp, or like a, a double arrow, which is more like um, regular function composition rather than application. Um, I guess we should uh, distinguish those two. But um, in this case, it's, it's uh, a one-line definition. I'm not going to go into it, but it's, it's definitely interesting that a lot of this uh, comes from a language that a lot of people aren't familiar with. Um, and it has a lot of other features. I'm going to talk about one that really caught my eye when I first started learning F Sharp. But some of these others are really exciting and uh, certainly could deserve their own talks. Um, and I definitely recommend you check out the language to sort of see what some of these other things are about. So let's dive into algebraic data types. You've probably heard this from a couple other talks so far. but it's not always clear what we mean by an algebraic data type. And I'm not going to go into deep theory, but I do want to make it clear that there are two kinds of things you tend to see in these data types you define in these languages. You have the product types and the sum types. And we could split hairs a little more and, and go deeper, but the, the general idea here is on the product side, we're combining multiple things together at the same time. I have two values at once. So a pair of integers that I'm calling a point here. You could also call records a product type, or objects if you think in terms of JavaScript objects, or tuples, or structs, or, you know, these are called all sorts of names in, in languages. But it, it, in a lot of cases, data types for many people only mean the product type. Um, sums are really interesting. This is where you get a lot of power in functional programming, at least um, when you talk about pattern matching or case analysis, because sometimes you don't have everything, you have a special case. You want to represent something specific, and instead of taking a product type and putting nulls all over the place, we want to represent exactly what we do have and what we care about in that specific representation of that type. Um, a common one is, is the list. You have an empty list, and then you, you can add something to the head of the list and, and build this thing up. You have a lot of others, um, like the, the maybe type in Haskell, or, or uh, it's called option in F sharp, or even you know simple you know A, B, and C. You know you may have just have three random settings for your your domain. I, I don't know what it would be called, but you you can have any number of these these cases, including a single case, which is a nice way to just wrap this up and maybe even vary it in the future. Um, so here, I wanted to point out right below the type, we have a construction of this list. And I've purposefully used different names to make this separate from what most people think of as lists. We've got these constructors, prepend and empty. Prepend takes two, uh, two parts. Oh, sorry, I need some commas in there, but um, pardon, pardon the, the missing commas. Um, so they, they should be right after the one and right after the, the, uh, the two there. The, the idea here is that we're taking a pair. And yeah, the, the star operator and the type declaration is a little weird. I'm not going to really go into the history of that. But it, it means we're basically going to parameterize our case and say we've got a little data that goes along with it. In this case, I've got two items, the value I want and then the rest of the list. And so I'm constructing these. And this is just how, how I create a value. Uh, and these, these are just regular uh, parts of the data type, so our description follows um, directly from, from where we want to construct, how we want to think about building these things up. And this is really key to a lot of functional programming languages, and we'll see why in pattern matching in a second. Um, you'll know these things by a few names, variants, discriminated unions, which is what f -sharp calls them, coproducts, tagged unions, disjoint unions, I'm sure there are many others. Don't get stressed out over the name. Just remember that we have two different ways of combining things. And it's kind of like an and and an or. You know, I have all of these things at once, or I have this one, or this one, or this one. Um, and that's, that's the key takeaway there. One more part of F sharp that uh, we need to be familiar with to move forward is function declaration and uh, application. So here I have F, X. And what it is, is it names something called f that takes a parameter f. And the let is required there. It's a little different from Haskell. But all declarations, value declarations, function declarations, use this sort of uh, this shape. 
And so this just allows us to create a function that adds one. So f is like increment. I also have add. It takes two arguments. Uh, very simple. It's a curried form. Uh, it's not a big deal for this talk, but uh, if you notice the lack of commas in there, uh, it's a common thing for F-sharp style code. And here we can see we can apply add in a, in a few styles. I can use the pipeline operator, or I can just call it directly. Uh, almost the same thing. Um, in the second one, I'm technically adding things in the opposite order, but uh, fortunately, addition commutes, so we don't really, really care. Um, <clears throat> Now, in, in the, uh, on the other side of the slide, I just wanted to sort of note some data literals. Uh, semicolons instead of commas are used to delimit things inside of lists and arrays, which the one with the extra pipes are the arrays. Um, property access and method calls look something like this. This is used when you want to interoperate with libraries. We'll see this in some of the example code, so it's good to know that it just looks like you might expect. Um, the capitalization there is really a .NET uh, convention. You don't have to capitalize your methods and properties. But most of the time when you see this in F Sharp, it's coming from, from that convention because you're just calling a .NET library. You, you could name it whatever you want, but this is the, the convention. So let's dive into pattern matching now. Um, there are a lot of uses and benefits of pattern matching, but the key thing here is we have some data. We put it right between match and width in F sharp. And then we have our cases below. And so I have this, this method called try find. And I'm just trying to find something. And it might optionally return something. So I might have some or none. This is like maybe with just or nothing or all of the other optional uh, variant representations that we've seen. And so here, some could actually pass in the thing we found, or we may have nothing. But what's interesting about this is the compiler knows a little bit more than we're, we're letting on here. If I leave off none, that's a valid pattern match, but it knows something's wrong. It knows something's missing. The none there is part of the definition. If I go backwards just for a second here to that sum type, I have two, two cases there with with this option type, it's the same. So the compiler will know I'm missing a case in the case analysis, and it will point it out and say, by the way, you, you've left off none. Uh, that might happen. And if it happens, your code's going to crash. And so it helps you keep your code up to date. It's a very, very useful feature to have as you're maintaining code over time. You may add cases to a data type. Your domain gets more and more uh, sophisticated and having the compiler be able to point out when you've forgotten to update old code is invaluable. Um, when you need to match multiple things, you can actually create a tuple. Here, I have the remainder uh, from dividing by 3 and 5 in this integer. And here, we see that I'm matching just sort of the pairs. Instead of just the top level constructor, I can also look into product types. And this is why I wanted to start going into the details here. Um, the idea here is that whenever I have a pattern, the way the pattern matching works is going to mirror the way I construct the value. And there's, there's a, a, a deeper concept called, uh, well, it really comes from the Haskell community called constructor discipline. And what it means is my pattern must not contain function calls. It just needs to contain representable structures, even if I'm going backwards on the left-hand side. This allows it to do a lot of things like optimization of, of the matching and stuff, but it also keeps it very clear of what the compiler is going to be able to do safely. You know, we, we don't want random function calls or infinite loops to happen right in the middle of our, our match, or, or do we sometimes? Do we need to step into more sophisticated uh, scenarios where we need to compute a little bit in order to decide what to do. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at the, the trade-offs. Um, but in this case, we just have a pair, and we're matching 0 and 0 for the first one. This is, if you've all seen FizzBuzz, this is yet another version of FizzBuzz with pattern matching. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, the underscores are just sort of discarding the value, and uh, of course, 0 means it's, uh, it's a factor. So let's go on. 
So now we have some limitations. Now this is a lot of code on the right side there, so I'm not going to expect you to read everything there. But when we have these objects that aren't constructed, we don't have a way to, to use constructor discipline, like we talked about with that pattern matching scheme, to pull things out. We're actually just randomly pulling values out because there's no, there's no concept of you know, a constructor around an object with random properties, even computed properties that may not be stored as values. So how, how do we change this, this spaghetti code that we would like to have fall into our match statement into something we can use? Um, and so this is, this is a problem in almost all functional programming languages. You, you get to a boundary where you have to decide whether or not you want values that are simply constructed and easy to understand so other consumers of your data type know how to pull it apart and can see the representation, or abstracting away and, and actually having a module boundary where the apparent representation of your data type doesn't leak through to the users of your module. And unfortunately, this is a big problem in, in, in a lot of code. I, for example, one language I, I love writing is Erlang. Very big on pattern matching, but it has a very big problem when you, say, want to match on a uh, value from the dictionary module. It's, it's a complex structure. It's not going to be trivial to, to pull apart and decide whether or not a key is in there inside of a, a uh, pattern match expression. So moving from here, we, we come to this paper that was published uh, many years ago uh, called Active Patterns. Uh, well, it introduces active patterns. The title is Make Pattern Matching a Powerful and Flexible Feature. And this paper is quite accessible. I would highly recommend reading the first part if this is something that interests you. Um, it's, it's definitely going to cover a little more than this talk does, so I won't, I won't uh, go through everything, but you can easily find this online. It's, uh, it's a great paper. So we, we start with one case, um, one, one kind or flavor of active pattern called single case total pattern. Now, what do I mean by total? Really quickly, when I mentioned that the compiler would point out when I forget a case, that I haven't really completed my, my case analysis, that is what it is meant by total here. Not quite the same meaning as total functions or, or those sorts of things where we know something's going to terminate. Um, it, it's certainly just about having all of the variants. And in this case, it always has one specific case, and that's it. The value you pass into this, as long as it's the right type, will always return that one case. Now, why would you want to do this? This isn't really case analysis, is it? Well, if you have an object that you're just trying to bind values on, and it has a bunch of these properties that you would have to call into in some awkward way, this gives you a nice way to do that within the matching infrastructure. Um, so we have this example with rectangular uh, coordinates being pulled out of complex numbers. Um, and so we have two different ways of looking at the same kind of complex number. One is with the real and imaginary parts, and the other is with magnitude and phase, you know, the, the polar coordinate system. And this allows, in these two match cases, for us to ignore the underlying representation and just use the things that we want. And notice in the code here, I don't really have to say what, what I care about as far as the representation. I, I've maintained that boundary. I could, for example, take one of these rect or polar um, definitions and put it in a module and export it. So I could just use that as part of the library interface. Now let me go over the syntax really quick. We have these banana brackets. The banana brackets are just something that wasn't used, so they picked it. Um, and we, we put that around the outside, and then we have each case inside. Um, and then we have the first argument here, and the only argument, uh, x in this case, which is a complex. Um, and so this is maybe a little weird looking, but um, how are we extracting a value when it's a parameter? It's just a convention. Underneath the covers, these just turn into function calls. Um, and x is actually just 
getting past this thing in the match, match uh, value. So when you say match one, two with, and then I do rect and I passed in those things, it knows what to do with those things. So let's move on to multi-case. It's very similar. Let's look at the fizzbuzz case here. We started with this sort of manual, oh, let's check if it divides by three or check if it divides by five. And that was just straight in, in our logic that printed fizz or buzz. Here instead, we, we remove it one level and we're able to basically say, oh, we have, we have a, uh, a, a case that's fizz buzz, so I, I know what I need to do. I need to print this. Or we have fizz um, but not buzz, or just a number. And now the interface not only knows that I've checked all cases, so if we extend this little game with, let's say, another number, seven, now we have a way to check all of these and know that we haven't missed a case. So very simple, kind of, kind of leading towards you know, an obvious end, but, but there's something else we can do with the same, same feature. And it's, it's a little unexpected when you come across it in the paper. Partial patterns. So we talked about totality and the, the, the ability to know whether or not we've covered all of these cases. But sometimes what we're looking for really is about maybe being something and then not. And, and then there are other cases that aren't related to something that encodes. We just want to check optionally one thing and then move on with our case analysis completely separate. That way we don't always have to bundle all of our logic together in one place. So in this case, we can do two partial patterns. And the way this works is you use an underscore at the end to sort of denote that there could be other things, but we're not going to include them. And let me, let me go back one slide just to give contrast. Notice here when, when our, our uh, constructors inside of the active pattern, fizz, fizz buzz, right there at the top, they just call the cases and they pass what should be used in the pattern match, right? It's just they translate from the top to the bottom, right? We're generating these values. Here, instead, since we have a single case, we don't really need to use the name, but we do need to denote when we have a positive match or when we're like, well, uh, this doesn't apply. And so we use the option type. So we have some and none. In this case, we don't really even want to emit a value, so we even use unit, just this empty tuple. Uh, you know, tuple of zero elements, basically. So we have two parens after sum, and that just says we've matched, great. And down below we see fizz, buzz, f you know, and, and, and here we have one new syntactic thing that's also unique to uh, F sharp. You see an ampersand between fizz and buzz. The ampersand uh, allows us to take two separate patterns and say these need to match at the same time. Now, this wouldn't really make sense or really be possible in other languages because they don't have the concept of these partial patterns that could match at the, at the same time but be totally different things. Usually, you have one kind of constructor. Again, in our type, you either are some or none. You can't be some and none. But here, we can actually be fizz and buzz at the same time. So it's a really interesting case. There's one more really interesting feature that we can do. We so far have only had one parameter to our active patterns. These active patterns uh, also support multiple parameters. What happens when I pass a little more into, into this? So here we're using the regular expressions API in .NET. Uh, many people complain that it is quite ugly. Um, I'll let you decide, but if we look at that active pattern, it successfully wraps this idea up Maybe a lot of code, maybe not. But down below, this match is really, really beautiful in the sense that we're matching this string against this regular expression called groups. And it allows us to pull out a zip code that optionally might have a zip plus four. And this is a really simple piece of code. You can look at it and read it and you know, minus the somewhat opaque regular expression syntax that we all inherit. It's not so bad. It's, it's actually really nice. And so we can start building more expressive APIs with this. This gets us closer to the what do I mean by a label rather than 
really is pattern matching just about understanding the representation of our types and assuming that those are always the most obvious. This is really where active pattern starts pulling further and further away and thinking more about pattern matching in a semantic sense rather than the literal data type we have. There's one more thing to mention. Uh, Active patterns, since they are actually underneath the cover, just like functions, they can be passed around just like a first class function can. So this is a toy data structure, uh, not really an interesting kind of tree, but the, uh, the branch function here allows us to think of different variants of parts of the data structure. But collect just takes this pred. And so we can pass anything in that has that same shape, this single case partial pattern. And internally, it will use that name in its match. But then when we call this, we can actually call it with any kind of partial pattern we want when we're traversing over this data structure. Uh, it's a really neat uh, way to be able to make certain things a little more generic than they might otherwise be. So in review, we've got basically a table that looks like this. Uh, the single case total, kind of a way to project what you care about. Multi-case total, it's just like creating a, um, a temporary choice or some type that doesn't really exist, but only for the, the, the scope of that pattern match, you can create a new set of options. The partial patterns, uh, here we only show single case. The paper does discuss multi-case partial, although it admits that there still have not been any useful applications found for, for this specific variant. And then we have parameterized uh, variants, and you can actually pass parameters to a lot of these uh, forms. And so yeah, that's active patterns. Uh, they make pattern matching much more extensible. Um, I, I like the idea that it moves between sort of the, it has to be exactly literal constructor discipline to a more flexible, we can express things that we want, um, whether or not they existed in the data type or even our notion in a type itself. Um, and that's it. Thank you. I think I've got a couple minutes for questions. Let me think. I think it is a warning, but you can make it be an error, I'm almost certain. So, yeah, I'd have to check. Um, yes? Um, I'm just curious, with the, um, with the partial patterns, um, is there any exhaustive checking, exhaustive checking in uh, that you could always use? Like, um, you know, what in its expanded form would still exist? So, let's, yeah, let's go back and, and think about the pattern matching in this example at the bottom there. Um, the underscores, as soon as you use underscores, you're sort of admitting that you don't care about total case checking. Um, so with the partial patterns, you do not get that. There's no way for the compiler to understand the other partial cases you intended to include with the one you used first, um, because they're, they're ad hoc at that point. Yeah, you could do something like that, although uh, F-sharp, if, if I understand your question, doesn't support row polymorphism. Yeah. So the specific kind of types you would be encountering are not going to really include that directly. Mm -hmm. The place you might find that is when you deal with the object-oriented side, which can many times have dynamic structures. If it's something like JSON, for example, you may be dealing with lots of dynamic lookups and stuff like that. And this is where certainly there's, there's a lot of value in having that. So you have to still predefine your types if you want to use it. If you want to. Yeah, it, I, you, you need to bring it into something where F -sharp can instantiate some label, whether it's, it's uh, partial or total in, that, in, in the banana brackets. All right, I think I may be out of time. Yeah, OK. Well, uh, catch me after. I'll be around for a part of tomorrow at least. So um, let me know if you have more questions. We can explore it. Thank you. <laughs>